That's great. You can hear me on this this screen. I hope we're still uh, waiting for one more Judith uh, Robertson. Uh, really nice to uh, to be here and and having a conversation about how we can make sure that that our banking system becomes more inclusive and, and how potentially open banking can be a real help in that. Uh, we, uh, we've been, yeah, I'm just noticing that there's a, a, a challenge with uh, uh, Commissioner Robertson's uh, ca uh, camera, but um, hopefully we'll get that resolved and she'll get some, some assistance on that when we get started. Um, Anyway, we, uh, we're, we're very lucky to have with us today Commissioner Judith Robertson from the FCAC, the fin uh, Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. And they, they really are looking at, at ways to make sure that consumer interests are well managed uh, uh, and well regulated uh, and that, consumer, um, uh, that consumers develop a stronger uh, ability to uh, manage their finances and improve their financial literacy. We uh, also uh, are, are fortunate to, to have with us uh, uh, Liz, Liz Maholland, who is uh, the CEO of Prosper Canada. And uh, Prosper Canada is a charity that, that uh, helps those who are living in poverty to uh, gain access to, to, to credit and alternatives to improve their, uh, their financial capacity. And also Andrew Graham, who's uh, co-founder and CEO of BorrowWell, which uh, exists in this space to help people improve uh, their credit and uh, give consumers the ability to uh, to improve their financial stability. And now I, I gather 2 million Canadians using this service. So it's uh, a very, very uh, worthwhile. Now we were going to start with Judith. Um, we can't see you, but are you there, Judith? Well, we can try. Can you hear me? I can hear you, so that's great. Oh, well, that's just fine then. We can we can go ahead. I I'm not sure why it's just not picking up my camera, but uh, uh, trust me, nobody's missing anything. <laughs> that's great. Well, why don't we have you start with on. with an overview of the FCAC? Sure, uh, very happy to. Thank you very much, Senator. I'm uh, uh, very delighted to, to be here. Uh, such an interesting and uh, completely um, wide open and diverse conference, so very exciting. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with FCAC, uh, we're a federal agency and our mandate is consumer protection in financial services. So we're part of the federal uh, suite of uh, regulatory oversight of the financial sector. And we uh, accomplish the man this mandate in two different ways. Uh, first, we are a regulator, we're a market conduct regulator, so our role is to oversee compliance with requirements that protect consumers, so uh, interactions with consumers like disclosure, like consent, and for the treatment of complaints or resolution when problems occur. Uh, we regulate federally regulated financial institutions, so that's primarily banks. Uh, and all of these requirements on the market conduct side, uh, uh, just to uh, be uh, crystal clear, are really there to recognize and address the fundamental knowledge and power differential when an individual is dealing with a sophisticated and usually large financial institution. Uh, and we know that these differentials are magnified for what we call vulnerable groups. So uh, hence our, our real interest uh, here today in this particular conversation. And then that leads us to the second way that we fulfill our consumer protection mandate, which is that we conduct research and create uh, educational materials to improve financial literacy of consumers. So trying to arm consumers, if you, if you like, to be better protected through uh, improving their knowledge base. So our interest here is both to ensure that consumer protection is uh, included uh, as we are formulating uh, the future of our financial industry and to encourage the development of the industry in a way that maybe can uh, actually improve and address some of the uh, persistent challenges that we have in access to financial services for, for vulnerable, group, vulnerable groups in, in our existing environment. Uh, so that's that's the uh, the thumbnail sketch, uh, Senator. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. We'll see if we can get my camera working. 
That's great. Thanks very much. And I'm going to go next, if I could, to uh, Liz Mulholland, who's been with uh, CEO of Prosper Canada for the last 10 years, and it's a charity dedicated to helping those who uh, who are living in poverty and, and are, are in need of, of help to improve their financial capacity. Liz. Thanks very much, Senator Deacon. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is just um, the types of barriers to affordable credit in Canada and who they impact um, and what the impact of lack of access to affordable credit is uh, right now. So um, one of the key reasons that people might not have access to affordable credit is they don't have any access to mainstream lenders, so banks, credit unions, uh, in their local community. So thinking of rural, remote, northern and indigenous communities where often there is no longer any local bank or credit union, um, and it may be prohibitively expensive for people to uh, to leave their community to go to one that does have a bank um, or credit union. Uh, so consequently, um, they're just not part of that whole system. Um, in urban areas, in low-income neighborhoods, uh, in some cities in Canada, not all, um, you also see an absence of mainstream banks and credit unions, uh, and in their place, an abundance of high-cost lenders. Um, who um, become the primary source of credit, uh, uh, which is not affordable for many people. It's extremely high cost and high risk. Um, another reason that people might not have access to credit is they have no credit history. Um, that can be because they're new to Canada. So they may have a credit history in their own home country, but not yet in Canada. They may be low income and afraid to borrow, uh, maybe prudently because their income doesn't uh, allow the margin they need to pay back a loan. Um, they may be reliant on informal lending from friends and families to get by and prefer that to formal lending, uh, which leaves them without any form of credit record. Um, and also credit scores may rely, uh, typically rely on a set of data that doesn't fully take into account the typical types of payments that people with low incomes make, such as rent and bill payments. Um, so while they may have a credit history of sorts, it's not one that shows up in the credit bureau's credit score. So, um, so certainly uh, broadening, uh, you know, the types of data that are included um, could help bring more people into the um, affordable credit um, realm. Um, some people have poor credit history, uh, so they've uh, run up debts uh, that they defaulted on, etc. Um, they have a sporadic payment history, etc. Um, unfortunately, if you're low or moderate income in Canada, apart from communities that have a nonprofit credit counseling agency, you may find it difficult if you're in the situation to get help to tackle your debt and to repair your credit score. Um, so uh, people with poor credit history um, may be shut out for quite a long time uh, from affordable credit. Um, also, people who lack assets um, uh, that can be used to secure more affordable loans are also in this group. And again, most low income people in Canada also have low assets and savings. Um, uh, in fact, many middle income people have low savings. Um, so uh, that's uh, the, the lack of savings is, a, is an important dimension of this um, problem as well. Um, and finally, uh, mainstream Financial lenders often find that there's very little or no profit in uh, administering lots of affordable small dollar loans, uh, which is the type of loan that many people with low incomes are seeking. Um, they're just too costly to administer, so they don't offer them. So, um, so there's a kind of market failure at this end there, uh, which fintech and open banking can potentially help address. Um, so definitely um, lots of interest in that. There are a few other factors that are more generic uh, when you're talking about low income and vulnerable populations in Canada that also uh, kind of contribute to this problem. One is just general language and literacy barriers. Um, many people with low incomes actually lack government ID that they need to participate in the financial mainstream. Uh, and that can be a costly barrier. Uh, it can cost you a lot of money to yeah. get a uh, new ID. Um, low financial literacy and low awareness of more affordable credit options can mean that somebody may actually have access to more affordable credit, but may not uh, act on that because of low awareness of their options. Um, there's also kind of a widespread distrust of mainstream financial institutions when you get into marginalized populations due to bad experiences that people may have had, and particularly fear 
of unexpected days and with havoc in your monthly finances and, and lead to a cascade of uh, you know uh, NSF charges, etc. That um, can really plunge somebody into a financial crisis quickly. Social norms are very important too. Um, in many low-income neighborhoods, uh, people's family members, their friends and neighbors may all use high-cost lenders. Um, it's not uncommon to hear in our work somebody saying that they bank at Money Mart, not realizing that Money Mart is not a bank, uh, it's just a high-cost lender. Um, so, uh, but those social norms are very powerful in shaping people's expectations of what is appropriate for them. Uh, Finally, we know that low-income people in neighborhoods are expressly targeted by high-cost, high-risk lenders um, who are very good at delivering very accessible, tailored products for this market and very effective marketing that is often very personal and often means that low-income consumers feel more comfortable with um, how this impacts people is that generally in Canada, the poorer you are in terms of your income, the more you will pay for credit. Um, it also means that you're likely to be more reliant on high risk loans that can trigger debt spirals. Uh, I will never forget the day a credit counselor told me about a client who had amassed 30, uh, uh, an initial $400 loan can spiral over the course of a year or two into a $34,000 loan. So, um, these are risky uh, forms of credit, but they're the ones that people are driven to when they can't access more affordable credit. Um, for households that lack emergency savings as well as access to affordable credit, it means that they are chronically living on a financial knife edge with no margin for error or any safety net in the event that one of life's little emergencies happen, the car breaks down, somebody gets sick, etc., leaving them at constant risk of financial crisis which when you're very low income can lead to evictions um, and all sorts of uh, sequelae that are uh, extremely hard to come back from. Um, it also means fewer opportunities for people who live in poverty to invest in things like starting a business or self-employment, accessing some training or getting the, the the work boots and the hard hat that they need to take that job that's available to them. Uh, so without some money or some access to credit to make these small investments, uh, people will uh, not be able to take advantage of opportunities to invest in their own future and to tap into greater economic opportunities. So the bottom line is lack of sure. access to affordable credit is a big problem and uh, very interested uh, to see what types of solutions open banking and um, uh, uh, fintech offer, but recognizing also that there's no magic bullet um, and that many people with low incomes and vulnerable people lack uh, digital literacy or access to the internet. So uh, we're going to have to pursue a range of solutions. Thank you very much. Emily. Great. Thanks, Liz, for getting us started. And, and I think it's really important the context of, of that that uh, uh, the commissioner, uh, FCAC Commissioner Judith Robertson has provided in terms of the, the regulator's perspective and you as a charity trying to help uh, individuals that are really, at, 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 you know, in, in a very vulnerable uh, position. Um, in terms of Andrew, uh, you've got you've got a solution that really targets the the sorts of problems that were being talked about here, and uh, and and I'd love to have you just sort of provide your perspective on how open banking can start to provide people with the opportunity through organizations like yours to improve their credit scores and gain access to much more affordable credit. Um, uh, obviously, where appropriate, um, but Andrew, just give us a bit of a, a an insight into what what uh, Borrow Well offers and and what open banking, when it is formally available in Canada, uh, will be able to provide individuals, the vulnerable vulnerable individuals like uh, like Liz and 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 Judith have been talking about. Yeah, well, Senator, thanks for that, and and really great to hear the. Um, the opening remarks from my, my other panelists. Uh, you know, what we do at Borwell, we're really focused on helping people um, find financial stability and really accomplish their financial goals wherever they are on the credit journey and on the finance on their financial journey. So we have people across the credit spectrum, um, you know, use our service. We've helped about 2 million 
people learn their credit score in many cases for the first time. And then we provide free advice on how to improve it. We match them with financial products that will be a great fit for them based on their credit profile and their financial goals. And then we also have a, a range of um, more concrete solutions. So we have um, a secured credit card. That's a credit card you can get without any uh, any sort of credit history or, or strong credit. So you can use it to build your credit. We have a credit building loan. And we also have a service where you can attach your bank account. And this is sort of the, the transition into open banking. We have a service called Boost where you can attach your bank account. We analyze, um, we use technology to analyze your uh, inflows and outflows, you know, the, the money that you're earning. And then of course, what you're spending um, to be able to predict cash flow, because exactly as Liz just mentioned, for many, many people, um, you know, uh, handling the ups and downs of income over the course of a month or, or a few months is a real challenge. So what we want to do is help people um, avoid missing payments on bills uh, and really, you know, be able to show financial responsibility to, to lenders because that's the best way to lower costs of, of credit. So I think when it comes to open banking, uh, open banking is a real opportunity for uh, organizations like, like mine and, and many others uh, to build the next suite of products and tools um, to help consumers better understand and better utilize you know, their own financial data and their own financial position. And so you can think of um, you know, wanting to go to a, a different bank and apply for a loan and be able to port to share with that bank all your transaction history for the last couple of years, all the different you know paychecks you've received. I you know consumers should be allowed to do that. Open banking would make it a lot easier. And then of course the example I just shared of our service called Boost, where you know you uh, we analyze your banking transactions to be able to predict cash flow because that's just not a service that any banks in Canada that I'm aware of offer today. So I, we want to help consumers be able to do that and. Oh, having open banking would really make that a lot easier. And I'm happy to to talk later on if you want about you know some of the challenges with the current system where we have to use technologies like screen scraping and how open banking will make that so much easier to be able to help consumers accomplish their financial goals and and uh, and live you know lives where they worry less about finances. That's fantastic, Andrew. And it, it makes me think of, of um, data that I saw from the Philadelphia Fed, a study they did over eight years, uh, looking at at, uh, at the lending uh, work of Lending Club as a fintech lender and comparing how predictive the FICO scores or their credit scores in the United States uh, were of a person's credit worthiness relative to the, the types of alternative data analyzed alternatively by this fintech lender. And they found that that when lending clubs started, there was an 80% correlation between the, the judgment of a person's credit worthy uh, with, a, with the lending loop as, as with their FICO scores. But after eight years, that, that had dropped to below 30%. Uh, in terms of that correlation, they're finding a real divergence, and the the Philly Fed uh, said that they they viewed it that within the uncredit worthy population, <laughs> as defined by credit scores, there were invisible prime borrowers who yep. did not have the traditional metrics uh, that would that give them access to credit. So that, that it's showing us that there really is a path forward here to look at at your financial data and alternative data differently to give access uh, to improve credit scores, which helps you with getting insurance. It helps you in, in so many so many ways. So what I'd love to talk about for a bit, if I could, and, and maybe it would be great to start if I could with you, uh, Commissioner Robertson, is, is what risks do we need to manage in this transition? And what are you seeing uh, lessons learned from other markets that are further ahead than us? That's just about every country in the world in open banking. <laughs> but uh, what 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 risks have you seen and how have they been managed and uh, and what do you see as being the opportunity to make sure that we get that we learn as followers uh, from from the lessons of other economies and and other different regulators and how they've made this adjustment um are you on mute am on mute gosh you'd think that by now i would be able to <laughs> remember to do that my apologies no, it's, a, it's a requirement of every session to have that yeah so uh so yeah thank you 
Um, so, you know, anytime you're transitioning from sort of one regime to another regime or an environment to another regime, there's a risk that it gets worse before it gets better. So I think that that is, uh, that is one thing that we are trying to understand is to ensure that we don't uh, uh, make what we currently have worse uh, before we see the promise of, of the future set. And I really like what Liz says, there's no magic bullet here. Uh, but that is also the opportunity set in that uh, perhaps we can, with a bunch of different things, uh, actually uh, end up with a, um, a, a collective future that is better. So a couple of things that are very much on our mind are around access. Uh, and so if we, you know, paint a picture where nobody has a bank branch anymore and uh, everything is online, uh, very quickly, we uh, we will see that 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 actually is terrible for uh, virtually every population that uh, has some area of vulnerability. And we've just lived uh, a, a real life exper experiment with that with COVID. And so we've done some research uh, uh, over the past year, and it's very clear that uh, it is vulnerable populations who have been disproportionately affected by branch closures. So that's something we have to be very careful about. This is related to the digital divide. It's related, you know, something Canada has that is not actually applicable elsewhere, uh, except for perhaps in Australia, is the, the geographical challenges we have with access uh, to uh, digital uh, technology and, and digital access. And we have particular population uh, uh, segments, in particular indigenous populations uh, that are uh, particularly difficult to, to reach. So these are the things that we are uh, trying to make sure that we are uh, watching for and uh, setting out uh, some parameters. I would say the other thing that, that we want to be particularly uh, careful about at the outset is that we think about what we do when things go wrong, because they will go wrong. There will be data issues, a breach. There are uh, today, so it's reasonable to expect there will be in the future. Right, so we have to think about when, not if, and then what happens when that occurs? And here, I think that we've had, we have some good examples. Uh, I'll use the UK example. Uh, they set up a, a kind of a zero liability system, not perfect, but at least they had one point of contact for consumers uh, and consumers weren't uh, sort of on their own in trying to figure out, well, who's liable? and whose fault was it, and trying to sift through the interconnectedness of, of data and uh, product that uh, this new world would be. So I think those are two of the biggest issues on our part is ensuring that we are managing access carefully so we don't make it any worse. And then secondly, to ensure that we have a clear, comprehensible and uh, effective way of uh, consumer redress when things go wrong. No, I think that's really, really worthwhile. And I, one of the things that you and I've talked about at another, in another occasion is the need for regulations to enable innovation as we move forward, uh, I think is a really important uh, consideration. Now, I think we just lost Liz momentarily, so we'll, hopefully she'll be back in. Um, but to, the, the, the need for regulations to sort of change our, our way of looking at them to be a floor versus mm. a, a ceiling. And, uh, and and to allow for for innovation uh, and you know and I think to recognize some of the significant limitations in our current system especially for vulnerable Canadians around the vortex of payday lenders as Liz was just speaking about uh, you know there's there's a there's a number of elements that aren't working for folks in what we have so it's I'm, I'm with you that we've got to make sure that we, we we try and just move up if we can and I think that's maybe of being a last follower that's going to be a good a good thing for us so uh, I was going to go to uh, to Liz to ask uh, sort of how do we you know what are some of the ideas of helping marginalized Canadians gain, gain access to, to fintech or uh, digital lenders but Andrew why don't you step in on that because you're now dealing I, I gather with about two million Canadians um, it, you, from a variety of backgrounds one would expect um, how are you working as an organization to make sure that those who are um, those who are in more vulnerable uh, populations uh, and less digitally uh, em embracing uh, to gain access to platforms like yours? 
Well, I think you know the great. It's true that not everybody you know has ready access to to digital solutions, but for for you know every day more and more people do. And the great news is that digital solutions can bring you know a lot of transparency um, and very easy price comparison. So you know core to our value prep proposition is not only showing you your credit score, but then you know using um, technology to then I explain to a consumer what are the best uh, lending options that you're likely to be approved for? So there's an optimization component. So it's, okay, fine. So my credit score is a 700 or, or what have you. What does that actually mean? Well, what it means is here are the best credit solutions for you given your score. And so we help with that shopping process because I think, I think that's a big challenge when it comes to financial services. There's a real you know, cost and stress for many people in shopping around and going mm -hmm. branch to branch amongst you know four or five banks or credit unions or what have you it's very time consuming it can be very stressful and being able to compare online and really understand what your your best solutions are um you know is is i think for many people very powerful and and uh, really desired i mean imagine if you had to go you know to the offices of of air canada versus westjet versus some other airline to compare prices you know most people don't want to do that they want to go to a price comparison site you know, we try to do exactly that in financial services. You know, it's no, it's no shock that many people want exactly that. And 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 those who don't have as easy digital access or maybe as as much comfort in, in using digital tools, uh, they don't have a smartphone. What what have what have you been looking at in terms of alternatives in that regard from from your business's perspective? I mean, I, I think the first thing to say is it, it is a vanishing, it, it's a, it, it is a decreasing, already a small, and it's a decreasing share of the population now that doesn't have ac any access um, to the internet. It's not to say that that people who don't, um, uh, you know, that, that they shouldn't be served. But I think the pandemic has even heightened the importance um, of government providing basic access to technology as, as vital. I mean, just like we want all Canadians to have access to water and to electricity, we should also want them to have access to the internet so that they can access education and that they can access, you know, entertainment and what have you. And I think accessing um, uh, financial comparison and financial education tools are, are part of that. So, you know, I, I think um, I, I think you know that, that should be front and center. How do we make sure everyone has access to the technology that they they need to be able to do that? Uh, it's become a basic utility. There's no doubt about that, and it, it, but it is not universally available. Um, so, Liz, before I go back to you to, on the same sort of question, I would like to ask the audience that, when, that uh, may have questions to please uh, do their best to put them uh, into the chat. We'll, we'll look forward to be responding uh, to those questions that you have uh, from those who are uh, attending this event. Uh, so, Liz, what do you see as ways of making sure that we uh, at least for for commercial tools that are uh, really targeted at this same problem and and are cost efficient and 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 sort of have that that level of consumer trust that that uh, that the regulators would want to see and that you'd want to see. Um, how do we make sure that more people get access to those so that yes, they're not the silver bullet, but at least we're reducing the number that that uh, we have to find other ways to serve. What are, you, what are your thoughts or what have you been looking at and what have you been, what have you been advocating for in closing that digital divide? <laughs> Poor Judith, hang on to your chair. <laughs> um, I think there is a huge issue with trust in vulnerable populations and whose word they will accept. So in those communities, people over overwhelmingly rely on their informal networks for advice on financial matters and on a few trusted intermediaries yeah. that they interact with and they've grown to have a relationship with. Um, many of those are community agencies though who may not have the wherewithal to constantly assess and rate and select what are safe providers and what are unsafe providers to separate the white hats from the black hats or even the gray hats. So I think there's a really important role for FCAC in conjunction with industry and community stakeholders to actually agree on what are the criteria of safe, appropriate, affordable products uh, for Canadians uh, to establish some principles and criteria that everybody can agree to and that are ones that you can rate a product on um, and then to just 
have that comparison available to people through FCAC doing the rating as an independent objective agency and sharing that information so that if I'm a community financial health provider, I can work with my client and say, here is a site that compares all these products so you can decide which features are most important to you and you can select the one that works best for you. Um, because without some means to, as Andrew said, efficiently compare, that trust gap will mean that overwhelmingly people will stick with what's familiar um, and what they see others doing rather than finding the best option for them. And you're certainly, and, and community providers won't be able to fill that kind of assessment gap because they're very limited in their own resources. Um, so I think we need to find a, a kind of an efficient structural system solution to this, but one that everybody can buy into who's working genuinely to build financial health uh, in Canadians. Um, uh, and that will at the same time incentivize those that have substandard products to maybe up their game and improve the quality of their products so that they become more competitive and tilt the playing field in favor of consumers rather than as it is now actually in favor of predatory and high cost, high risk lenders. So I, I think it's only appropriate then to uh, to to go to Judith and 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 ask about that. Uh, but I'd say it, it, I'd I'd actually ask you: Do you see options for a private sector alternative in that regard? Because I know in open banking discussions, in terms of the regulatory change, there's a real concern uh, amongst uh, our highly credible fintechs to make sure that that there's a sort of a, uh, an accreditation process of those who are brought into the community. And the same is true, the banks would like to see that as well. And I think that, so I think there's a mutually agreed um, uh, 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 target of, of making sure that there's good assessment of the quality of these organizations and the services that they provide and that they're meeting uh, very clear, not minimum standards, but uh, professional standards that, that, uh, that allow that to be assured, not just to uh, consumers, but to each other and to the financial institutions that are sharing data at the consumer's request. Uh, where do you see us going? I mean, is this something that, that can be done in, in a self-regulating way? Is this something that it can be, it needs to be done? Because I do think there's there needs to be that accreditation is generally agreed. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. see this this unfolding from your standpoint? I think there's a difference between accrediting somebody who's running a legitimate business and actually rating products based on how much they help build consumer financial health. So, uh, and I think FCAC's mandate in terms of helping Canadians to build their financial health and providing good consumer information does have an appropriate role to play there above and beyond uh, a standard that um, uh, an industry led kind of self-regulatory accreditation process. Uh, would meet. Um, and it's not to say that everybody's a black hat who's not at the uh, acme of building consumer financial health. I think there's a lot of gray hats out there, but what we want to do is incentivize them to become whiter. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of private enterprises that wear white hats too. So I think over to you, Commissioner Robertson, just to have a, a sense of the, where you're at. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess in the black hat, white hat world, I'm the sheriff. Uh, <laughs> so, um, no, I mean, so first of all, you know, I have to thank Liz for her uh, tremendous vote of confidence that FCAC can can do this. But I will say, you know, our view is that uh, it's actually it's not uh, as straightforward as, uh, you know, we might hope, because, of course, there's an intersection between product characteristics and how that product is sold and how that product is priced uh, and so on. And so there's a lot of nuance. Uh, around, you know, you know, it's hard. It's hard to, I would say, just classify a product as, yeah, uh, meets a standard or doesn't. Um, so, um, however, directionally, uh, I would say that that is absolutely uh, the direction of uh, regulation in financial services generally, where regulation regulators are looking at, you know. Does not does a particular product meet these particular uh, requirements, but rather uh, what is the outcome of that product? Uh, and uh, is the outcome what was expected? Uh, and, uh, and this is where we can test whether there is a, a bias or some disproportionate uh, disadvantage and technology really assists us in doing that. Uh, you know, just by way of an example, 
uh, internationally, there are regulations around what's called responsible lending. So this is where the onus gets pushed a little bit more towards the lender, the supplier of credit uh, uh, to, to determine uh, whether that credit product is a right for that consumer and whether adding credit at this particular juncture is in fact the, the right way to go. And so uh, that is directionally where in, in Canada, we uh, our new banking regulation uh, uh, has a term called appropriate products. So banks will have to uh, satisfy uh, their boards who oversee this and us as regulators that they have a system in place to ensure that the products they are selling are appropriate to the population set. So you can see that that it's moving directionally there. It's not a beautiful, uh, you know, <laughs> chart that says good, bad, white, black, but uh, but directionally we're, we're, we're definitely going there. That's great. I um, I was intrigued, and I would like to just sort of spend a little bit of time. Uh, and if there are questions, we'd love to see them up in the chat. But I'm going to ask another one around um, biases built into systems. Uh, certainly, every system, be it an alg uh, uh, automated uh, uh, intelligence system in terms of, uh, of of AI or machine learning, or just our existing systems, have biases built into them too, too often. And and there is a need to really uh, focus on that. I was intrigued by that study that was from NYU Stern School of Business um, looking at the Paycheck Protection Program in the United States. And it was it used a lot of fintech lenders and a lot of big, small, uh, medium-sized banks and credit unions. And it, it was intriguing that Black-owned businesses, they identified that Black-owned businesses were seven times, more, up to seven times more likely to receive a paycheck protection loan for that small business than uh, those black owned businesses who tried to get one through uh, small, medium or large banks. And that was to me a very insightful element in terms of, of how potentially uh, AI can pre potentially present less bias in the system than our existing processes. But there is, it's well known that, that that's not true for all AI that's out there. So Andrew, if you could just speak to that issue a bit, because you, you, you have, have an have automated a... system. Your, your, your organization is built on automated systems that you're constantly refining. And how have you, how have you seen that, that, that issue evolve and where do you see it going? From your yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, look, look, there's, you know, um, you know, can there be risk in, you know, AI driven, you know, algorithmic um, systems? Absolutely. We, 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 you know, that's, that, that's very clear. We know there can be risks, but, you know, those risks are often, and I think in the example you just gave, it's a, it's a great example. In many cases are going to be, there's going to be less bias in, in, in that sort of system than in one where there's hu a heavy human um, involvement uh, and that's why, you know, sort of getting us back, I guess, maybe to open banking for a minute. What open banking is ultimately about is allowing consumers and businesses to take data that is theirs or data about them. For example, you know, what transactions you've made through your bank account in the last few years and allowing them to share that if they want to with a third party. For example, you know, a different bank or a digital lender. Um, and you know, I believe that if you give people uh, the ability to share their data and you give other lenders the ability to ingest more data, all other things equal, you're not gonna have a perfect system, but I think you're gonna have a better system uh, with, with less bias. Um, again, it's not, it's not you know, we're not gonna get to perfection, but we will get to a better place than we are now, like your uh, Paycheck Protection Program example just showed. So, you know, if if you believe if you if what you want is a system with less bias and more choice for consumers and small businesses, uh, you know, open banking is a really important part of that. And as you've pointed out, we're pretty far behind here in Canada. Um, not to mention the fact that in Canada we never even allowed um, fintech lenders to uh, administer our yeah. equivalent of the Paycheck Protection Program. We we made a policy decision at the federal level to limit that only to large banks and uh, and other sort of more traditional actors which was, was truly mystifying and disappointing for, uh, for, for many, many uh, of us working in the, uh, in the industry. I, I certainly concur with that. Uh, do you have, do you have uh, evidence to show that people getting information, like information around their credit 
scores helps them to improve their financial situation because I, I look at that as being one of the mandates of the FCAC is is to improve financial literacy and one of the best ways to measure that outcome is I would think over time an improving credit score do you have have you done analyses along those lines yeah so we, we, we our data team did an analysis uh, a little while ago looking at the relationship between how often someone checks their credit score with us or how regularly I should say, they check it and how long they've been with us. And there's a, a significant correlation between, um, you know, being a checking your credit score um, uh, over a, a longer period of time and more frequently, that correlates with a strong improvement in score. So whether that's people who are really motivated to improve their score, really like using a service like ours, um, you know, or, you know, and or it actually helps them improve it, that there's a very clear relationship. And I, I think, in some ways, free credit score is a great example of the power of open banking because that's taking data that is about a consumer that previously a consumer didn't have direct access to and, and making it accessible. Um, and I think that sort of shows the promise of, um, of what open banking could, could be more broadly. Thanks very much for that. And I just, I'm going to go back to each of you and ask for a final, sort of a final 30 second thought on, 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 so sort of the, the, the opportunity or, or concern you want to see managed, the opportunity you want to see access, the concern you want to see managed as it relates to those consumers who are, who are more vulnerable, uh, and the opportunity that open banking might bring to them but the risks you want to make sure are managed. So Liz, we'll start with you if we could and, and then go to uh, Judith Robertson and then Andrew. Thanks, Senator. Um, I agree with everything Andrew said, but I'd like to put an important caveat on the table that that correlation between checking the credit score and seeing improvements over time is in the context of people who are accessing really well-designed supportive services that you offer them that are aimed at building their uh, credit score and their, uh, their financial health. Um, that offering a free credit score can equally be used to sell people a predatory service that actually undermines and does nothing to build their credit. Um, and there are plenty of those out there. So yeah. um, uh, a lot is in what uh, comes with that. And just on the question of you know, bias, I think uh, I agree again with Andrew that um, the systems they're using in AI are better than uh, the human ones in some respects. But if you're not addressing some of those structural barriers that keep people from even accessing this, like the digital divide, like yeah. lack of ID or fear of mainstream financial institutions who are often offering fintech solutions. Um, in fact, low-income people prefer the ones that their banks offer, then we're just gonna further the divide here and keep helping some people do much better while leaving other people further behind. So I think that's a that crucial, a crucial yeah. point for us to keep in mind. Judith, final quick thought. Uh, so uh, two things. One is um, I think Andrew's example is really excellent and our research backs that up as well. Uh, and that is one of the promises of uh, this new technology is making it easier and more attractive uh, for people to plan. So our research says budgeting, but it's really just planning. Paying attention is the most important measure for improving uh, your finances at any income level, except for the most poor, uh, you have to have some income. So, so just uh, you know, on the positive, on the cautionary, I can't, I can't uh, uh, avoid that. Is uh, one of the challenges on data, as we have seen in other applications, is consumers really don't have any idea about uh, uh, how to manage their data, what the value is, what the risks are, and so this is something that we also need to pay particular attention to. They may be quite comfortable with their data, all their transactional data being used for one purpose, but that doesn't necessarily mean they want their employer to see yep. uh, all of their credit card uh, purchases on the weekend yep. late at night, uh, for yep. example. So uh, yep. I'll, I'll leave that. And, and thank you for that, uh, that point. And sadly, Bill C-11, our updating privacy legislation is not going to committee to be improved. It appears at this point in time, it's languishing in the House of Commons and Canada is behind in yet another area, sadly. And it's all too important that we get those updates. Uh, Andrew, final thought? Look, I think in, in general, you know, many not, you know, there's a tendency among some policymakers in, in this country to sort of say, look, we need to take things, you know, slow, whether it's open banking or what have you, we don't want to make mistakes. And I think it's important that people realize there's a real cost 
to uh, staying where we are. Um, yeah. You know, we, we have open banking in Canada today. It's just not very good. It's, it's essentially screen scraping. Millions of Canadians do that today. And there is a big lost opportunity um, to uh, help people, you know, who are credit seeking and need the most help, um, you know, advance on their financial journey by putting in place, you know, smarter, more, you know, um, uh, uh, flexible legislation that allows them to share their data and, and ultimately make better choices about their finances. So, you know, this is, this is an area where it's not costless to do nothing, which is kind of our current approach on open banking. And I would just urge anyone listening, you know, please, please share that with your, you know, member of parliament or with your friend uh, or family member at Finance Canada, uh, for example. So we, we, we really need to see movement here. Uh, the rest of the world is doing it. We, we, we've got to catch up. It's uh, the risk of inaction is is uh, a, a tremendous economic burden at this point in time. That's the one I'm more focused on than any. But I'm glad we've got uh, got a bunch of different perspectives offered here today. Thank you, Liz Mulholland, uh, Judith Robertson, and, and Andrew Graham. Uh, great point to finish on from my standpoint, Andrew. And and thanks everyone for for uh, participating.